this is Dr. Bricker here with some help for homework number seven, which covers uh, circular motion, so the circular motion part of chapter three, and then all of chapter six. So let's take a look at some of these uh, homework seven problems. Okay, the first one is uh, from chapter three. To withstand g-forces up to 10 g's, so 10 g's would be 98 meters per second squared, um, a fighter pilot trains on a human centrifuge. So 10 g's is about uh, 98 meters per second squared. If the length of the centrifuge arm is 12 meters, we want to know um, what is the speed the uh, rider experiences. Okay, let's take a look at this. Okay, so whenever you're going in a circle, there's an acceleration. And the acceleration is towards the center. So I'm calling it radial acceleration along the radius towards the center, and it's equal to v squared over r. So make sure you read that section of chapter 3. So um, the r here just means along the radius towards the center. So we're given the radial acceleration. That's the 98 meters per second squared. We're given the radius, which is 12 meters, so we'll have to calculate the speed. So this just gives you the magnitude of the acceleration, and the direction is going to be towards the center along the radius. So here we'll have to do a little bit of algebra. So multiply both sides by r, and you get v squared, and then take the square root of both sides. And that's equal to v. Okay, so that's how fast this uh, rider will have to be going. So it looks something like this. Here's the, the radius. Here's the person in the centrifuge going around in a circle. So uh, up this way, back down that way. So we're seeing kind of a slice of this. So the acceleration, again, is towards the center. Okay, let's take a look at the next problem. Okay, so in this one, in a roundabout or traffic circle, cars can go around a 22-meter diameter circle. Okay, so the radius of the circle would be half that then. So half of 22 is 11 meters. If the car's tires will skid when the car experiences a centripetal acceleration greater than 0.6 g's, so the acceleration is 0.6 times 9.8 meters per second squared. You'll have to figure out how much that is. What is the maximum speed of the car in this roundabout? So really similar to the last problem, the only difference being the radius is different and uh, the acceleration is different. So it's 0.6 times 9.8. So same procedure, solve for what the speed would have to be. So in the first problem, there was a, there had to be an acceleration towards the center. In this problem, there also is. Whenever you're going in a circle, there is an acceleration towards the center. Let's look at the next problem. Okay, so in this problem, we're given that the uh, a particle rotates in a circle, centripetal acceleration of 9. Okay, great. And we want to know a few things. What is the acceleration if the radius is doubled without changing the particle speed? Okay, so the radius is going to be doubled, but the speed is going to be the same. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so we can't just guess. If you double the radius, maybe the speed is half as much, or maybe it's twice as much. Um, so let's not guess. Let's actually utilize the formula that we have. Centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. Okay, so um, we're leaving the speed part the same. That's what I have up here. The new speed is the same as the old speed, but the new radius, that's the, I call it R prime, the new radius is uh, twice as big as the old radius, and we want to know what happens to the acceleration. So the acceleration is proportional to, that's what that symbol means, 1 over R. So if you make the radius twice as big, you have to make the acceleration half as much, because they're inversely proportional. Okay, so as long as you keep the speed the same, you make the radius twice as big, the acceleration is going to be half as much. Okay, you might have experienced this if you ever went on a merry-go-round before. If you're on the outside, it's a lot easier to hold on than if you're, well, actually, that's the opposite, isn't it? When you're on the outside, it might be harder. Uh, so that's quite not, that's not quite the same idea here. But, uh, but anyway, regardless, the uh, acceleration is inversely proportional. 
Okay, so now we go on to chapter uh, 6, which deals with uh, circular motion, but we're looking at the forces. So if there is an acceleration towards the center, you know from Newton's second law, there must be a net force towards the center. So in a sense, chapter 6 is all about looking for the force towards the center. Again, this is uniform circular motion, which means the speed is constant, but uh, the direction continually changes. So there is an acceleration towards the center. Whenever you have an acceleration, you have to have a net force. So keep that in mind, and let's take a look at this problem. Five meter diameter merry-go-round. Okay, so the radius is half that, 2.5 meters. It's turning with the period of 3.8 seconds. So the period describes how long it takes to go around just one time. Uh, in this problem, you want to figure out the uh, speed of a child on the rim. Let's take a look at it. So again, keep in mind what the period means. It means the time to go around one time. So I use capital T for that. That's a specific amount of time. Um, uniform circular motion. We have the speed is the distance around. So that's the circumference of a circle divided by the amount of time it takes to go around period. So that's the way to get the get the speed here. As long as you know what the period represents, it's not too bad of a problem. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so in this problem, the California sea lion is capable of making extremely fast, tight turns while swimming underwater. In one study, scientists observed a sea lion making a circular turn with a radius of 0.31 meters, so that, that is a tight turn, a third of a meter while swimming at four meters per second. Okay, excellent. We want to know uh, what is the sea lion's centripetal acceleration in units of g. So how many multiples of g is that? And they're calling it uh, centripetal. This is what I've been calling radial. It's the same thing, towards the center. And then um, what percentage of this acceler what percentage is this acceleration of a, an F-15 fighter jet who has an acceleration of 9 g's. So how does this compare to an F-15? All right, let's take a look at this. Okay, so um, the radius of the turn, 0.31. Here's the speed, 4 meters per second. You want to figure out the acceleration towards the center. Again, I'm calling it radial. They're calling it centripetal. It's the exact same thing. So v squared over r. So we have 4 meters per second squared divided by 0.31 meters. Let me see what this ends up being with my calculator here. So uh, 4 squared would be 16 divided by 0.31. So 51.61 meters per second squared. You can see how those units come out. So how many G's is that? Let's take 51.61 divided by 9.8, that will tell me how many g's I have. So let me divide that by 9.8. Whoops. 51.61 divided by 9.8. 5.26 g's. So quite a bit, not as big as a fighter um, jet, but, but a lot. So 5.26 g's, um, that's the answer for the first part and then figure out what percentage of 9Gs this is. So uh, I'll leave the second part to you, but you have 5.26 here, first part is 9, so figure out the percentage that 5.26 is of 9. Essentially 5.26 divided by 9 times 100. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, so here's a bird's eye view of particles on a string moving in horizontal circles. So it's a top view, you're looking down on these. All are moving at the same speed. Rank in order from largest to smallest the tensions. So as you can see here, uh, we have this picture. So this is mass m moving at speed v, radius r, m, v, 2r, etc. So uh, let's take a look at this in a little more detail. Okay, so what we have is the net force is MA for each of these. Uh, it's a special kind of A though, it's towards the center. Yeah, so we know what that is, you know, radial acceleration. We know that that's MV squared 
over r. And what is the force towards the center? This is the part that you have to provide. So for each of these, the only force towards the center is the tension. Okay, so we want to compare the tensions for all of these cases. So for the first one, it's just mv squared over r. For the second one, it's mv squared over 2r. For the third one, it's m, uh, sorry, 2m v squared over r. And then for the fourth one over here, it's 2m v squared over 2r. So I just, put, I just put in these specific distances for each of them. Oh, this is not squared. mv squared over r. Okay, good. So let's make sure I did this right. mv squared, mv squared, mv squared. Okay, the v's are all the same for each of them. Oh, that's good. Um, the mass has changed, though. m, m, 2m, and 2m. Okay, I've done that correctly. And then the uh, distance towards the center has changed. That's r, 2r. Okay, so simplify this a little bit, see which one's the largest, see which one's the smallest. I'll give you a hint, two of them actually tie. Okay, so big mass, short radius, you'll see the tension's going to have to be greater for that if you just visualize it happening compared to uh, a small mass uh, at a big radius. Okay, so uh, figure it out and see how it comes out. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so we have a 1600 kilogram car drives around a flat 230 meter diameter, okay, so keep that in mind, we'll probably need the radius, track at 27 meters per second. So we're just assuming a constant speed of 27. What is the magnitude of the net force? Well, you might say, well, the speed is constant, so there is no net force. But remember, when you're going in a circle, even though the magnitude of the velocity doesn't change, the direction keeps changing, so there is an acceleration. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Okay, so mass was 1,600, radius 115, speed 27. So let me give you like a bird's eye view again. So we're going in a circle like this. So what actually keeps the car going in a circle is friction. It's the static friction between the tire and the road. So imagine if you're driving this way and you hit a patch of ice and you try to turn you'll just keep going straight. There has to be some force towards the center, and it's the static friction on the tires that keeps it from sliding out, and that allows you to actually go on a turn. Okay, so here's the procedure, just like we did in Chapter 4 and Chapter 5. Net force, MA. It's just now we have a special kind of A because we're going in a circle, radial acceleration, and we know that that's equal to V squared over R. And then you have to ask yourself, what is the force towards the center? Here it turns out to be static friction. Uh, so if I wanted to, I could put static friction there. This problem doesn't even want that much detail. They just want to know how much is the net force. So the net force is just mv squared over r. And luckily we have all of those. m v r. Okay, so figure out what the net force is in this problem. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay, the passengers in a roller coaster feel 50% heavier than their true weight as the car goes through a dip of uh, radius 10 meters. Okay, so we'll have to see what that actually means, feeling heavier. That means the normal force is 50% more than it normally would be. Um, so if you're going through this dip and you're sitting on a scale, the scale would read 50% more. So the apparent weight is just what the scale actually reads. And by the way, this one has a video tutor solution. You can take a look at that. So if you feel 50% heavier, what is the speed at the bottom of the dip? Okay, let's take a look at this. Okay, so radius 10 meters, speed, that's what we're trying to figure out. Um, here's the picture. I drew the normal force larger than the weight. I did that on purpose. There has to be a net force towards the center. In order for there to be a net force towards the center, this one has to be bigger than this one. And they're actually telling us how much the normal force is. You feel 50% heavier, so the normal force is 1.5 of mg. That makes it 50% more, right? Usually the normal force is equal to mg if you're not moving. But to be 50% heavier means you're one and a half times what it would normally be. Okay, 
So that's what you got to bring to the problem. That's what 50% heavier means. Okay, so same procedure, net force, MA, special kind of A, MV squared over R. And then this is the part that we have to fill in, the actual forces. So I'm going to write normal force minus MG. That gives me a net force towards the center. This has to be bigger than that. And then, um, then I can solve for V. So it might feel kind of strange in the beginning of doing these uh, circular motion problems. We're looking at forces and things like that. Why do they keep asking me about the speed? Well, it's because the radial acceleration is equal to V squared over R. Okay, so um, then we can put some more details in. MV squared over R is equal to the normal force, which I know is 1.5 mg minus mg. Now notice they didn't give you the mass. We just have to have a little faith that the mass is going to cancel out. And it turns out it actually does. There's m in each term, so the m's cancel out. So then you have v squared over r is equal to 1.5g minus 1g, so 0.5g. And then this leads to v being equal to the square root of 0.5rg. So move the r to the other side, take the square root. Okay, very good. Let's look at the next one. Okay, this one, um, in an old-fashioned amusement park ride, passengers stand inside a 3-meter tall, 5-meter diameter hollow steel cylinder with their backs against the wall. So basically you're standing in a, in a cylinder. They actually have this ride at the Porter County Fair. The cylinder begins to rotate about a vertical axis. So pretend you're standing in there against the wall. Maybe you've actually experienced this ride before. So once you get up to speed, the uh, floor drops away. And passengers stick to the wall. Clothing has a static coefficient of friction that ranges from 0.6 to 1. And kinetic friction ranges from 0.4 to 0.7. What is the minimum rotational frequency? So I have to look at what frequency means. What's the minimum frequency for uh, which the ride is safe. Okay, so pretend your back's against the wall, you're going around in a circle. What's the minimum frequency so that you don't fall? All right, let's draw this out and take a look at it. Okay, so here you are. You're inside the cylinder. So basically, here's a wall of the cylinder. It goes over here. Here's another wall of the cylinder. They give you the diameter is five meters, so the radius is two and a half meters. And this is going to be rotating this way. So up, back, down, this way. So we want to know the minimum frequency so that you don't fall. Okay, so let's look at the forces quickly for this one. So here's the free body diagram. So um, you have a normal force towards the center. I'll just call it normal R towards along the radius. Then you have mg, which is going to be down, and what's keeping you from actually falling? It's static friction. And really it's the maximum amount of static friction. Because the minimum frequency means that you're utilizing all of static friction. Now the force that's towards the center is the normal uh, on your back. So as you're standing there, this is going around really quickly, there's a normal force towards the center, that's the force towards the center, and uh, the up and down forces, static friction's holding you up, mg's pulling you down. So we want to figure out what this frequency is. So from chapter 6 you know that the, the uh, frequency is 1 over the period. So if we could find the, the period, we could figure out the frequency. We also know that the speed is uh, the distance around divided by the period. We saw that in a previous problem. You could also write this as 2 pi r times f. The reason I'm doing this is to say, well, if you know the period, you could figure out the frequency. But also, if you knew the, uh, the speed, and we, are, we do know the radius, you could figure out the frequency. So if we can get the speed, we can get the frequency. Okay, so, so far I think this is one of the harder problems of the semester. So let's uh, Let's keep that in mind. If we can get the speed, we can get the frequency. 
look at let's look at the circular motion part. So the net force m a special kind of a. I know that that's v squared over r. So what is the force towards the center? Well, it's the normal towards the center. Okay, good. So again, if I could figure out the speed, I can get uh, I can get the frequency. The only problem is I don't know how much this force is. I also don't know what the mass is, but I'm hoping that the mass will cancel out. So this is the circular motion part of the problem. But it's one equation with multiple unknowns. I can't solve that uniquely. Luckily, I have this up and down direction. Maybe that will actually help me out. So I know that mg has to be equal to the maximum static friction. Now the definition of maximum static friction it's the normal force times mu sub s. So luckily, if you take a look at this, we've got this formula, multiple unknowns, this formula, a couple of the same unknowns. Um, M, normal, R. So I should be able to get somewhere with this. So what I would recommend doing if you're going to solve this, take this formula, solve for normal, R, so normal R, I'm looking at this and this, normal R is equal to mg divided by mu sub s, right, normal R, mg divided by mu sub s, take this and plug it back in here. When you do that, you'll see that the m's cancel out, and then you no longer need to know normal R because you've substituted something else in for it. Okay, so I'll leave it at that you'll be able to solve for V once you do that. So solve for V, put check mark, V is equal to, you can get that once you take this, plug it in here, solve for V. Once you get V, you're not quite done yet. You've got to come up here where V is equal to 2 pi RF, and then you can solve for the frequency. Okay, great. So uh, have fun with this one. It's, it's a fun problem. Let's take a look at the next one. All right, in this problem, we have a 0.2 kilogram puck on a frictionless horizontal table connected by a string through the hole in the table, as you can see in the picture there. Uh, with what speed must the puck rotate, this puck, what speed must it rotate uh, if the radius of the circle is 0.5 meters if the, uh, if the block is to remain at rest? So essentially, this is moving really fast fast enough that it's holding this thing up. We want to figure out what speed does that have to have. All right, let's take a look at this. Okay, so here's the picture. This one's going around fast enough that it's holding up this one. I'm calling this little m and this one big m. Okay, so um, let's, let's look at the free body diagram for big m. Tension, big mg. Uh, free body diagram for this one well, it's got its own normal force, which would be out of the page, little mg into the page. The interesting thing, though, here is the tension towards the center. Remember, there always has to be a force towards the center. My picture's not that great. Here's the center. Um, there always has to be a force towards the center if you're going in a circle. It's the tension that's towards the center here. Okay, so uh, let's look at the circular motion part of this one. Net force, little m little m times a, and it's a special kind of a again, mv squared over r. So what is the force towards the center and the little mass? Well, it's the tension. Okay, so in this problem, we're trying to figure out how fast you have to go to hold this one up. Well, I'm practically speaking, where, where am I going to see v? I'm, I need to find, out, find v. Well, I know it appears in the radial acceleration. Ah, good, so that's what I'm looking for. I know little m, I know the radius. The problem is I do not know the tension, so I can't solve for v. But I know that the tension has to be equal to big mg. Okay, so you can get the tension here, plug it back in here, and solve for v. And this, practically speaking, would work. Now on the Earth, there's always friction, so I mean you can get this going for a while, but even on ice, eventually, the friction is going to kill this thing off. But you can get it to work for a while until uh, friction takes away some of the energy. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay, 
so satellite motion. Um, satellites going around the Earth, the moon going around the Earth, the Earth going around the sun. We're going to approximate those as being circular orbits. So it, whenever anything's going in a circle, there has to be a force towards the center of the circle. So we've got a new force that we haven't talked about. It's um, the force... We've talked about the force of gravity, but we'll have a new formula for the force of gravity, a more specific um, um, uh, formula for that. We've been using that the force of gravity is equal to mg. That's good when you're close to the surface of the Earth, but when you start to move away, that force gets less and less. So we'll, we'll have a more detailed formula for the force of gravity coming up. Okay, well, let's let me read this one and then we'll work it out. A satellite orbiting the moon very near the surface has a period of 110 minutes. Okay, so that's the time to go around one time. Use this information together with the radius of the moon. So the radius of the moon is 1.74 times 10 to the sixth. So we're assuming that this uh, satellite is going very close to the surface. From this, we want to calculate the free fall acceleration on the moon. So what is the g of the moon? Okay, so let's take a look at that. Well, it turns out that anything with mass is attracted to anything else with mass. And it's called the force of gravity. It's the force due to things having mass. So if I'm looking at myself and the Earth, there's a force of, of attraction between us. And we can figure it out from this formula. So the force of gravity would be the first mass times the second mass. This new constant, big G, so big G, 6.67 to the minus 11th newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. So if you wanted to, you could, you could figure out the force of attraction between me and the Earth. What you would use is the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth. And then you can calculate the, this. Uh, this. You'll, you'll see that it turns out to be the same thing that we've been using um, for the weight. In this problem, uh, let me first show you this picture. So if you have mass 1 here, and mass 2 here. Anything with mass is attracted to anything else with mass. Here's the distance between them. I'm calling it R12. Just to emphasize, this is the distance between these. It's not like the radius of something. It's, it may, might be confusing to you if you see R. You think of that as radius immediately. But R is the distance between. Okay, so when things are going in a circle, there has to be a force towards the center. Sometimes it's the force of gravity that's towards the center in the satellite motion part that we see here. Okay, so given the period, the radius of the, uh, the moon, we want to calculate the g of the moon. So let's actually do that. Okay, so again, that's the, that's the force that's towards the center. Now, if we want to figure out the actual radial acceleration of the uh, moon, we don't quite have to, to use that yet. We could use v squared over r. But remember what v is, 2 pi r over the period, right? The distance around divided by the period. That is v. Don't forget to square it in the formula. So this is v squared. Um, we still have to divide it by r. So I'll just multiply it by 1 over r. Let me expand this a little. 4 pi squared r squared over the period times r. So one of the r's actually cancels out. So you get 4 pi squared r over the period. Oh, period squared. This whole thing is squared. Do you know how I realize I forgot the squared is just looking at the units? It's got to be meters per second squared. So if you want to figure out the period of the moon, we just did v squared over, or sorry, the acceleration on, on the moon. We did v squared over r. The v I could write as 2 pi r over the period. Don't forget to square it. And then I still have a 1 over r left. One of the r's cancels out, and I'm left with 4 pi squared r over the period squared. The only thing to be careful with here is the radius is given in SI units. The period's given in minutes, so you have to turn that into seconds. And then you can figure out the acceleration um, on the moon due to gravity. Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay, in this one, the centers of a 13 kilogram ball and 130 gram lead ball are separated by 15 centimeters. What is the gravitational force each exerts on the other? So here's where we could actually use our new formula to calculate what this force of gravity is. You don't usually think about it, right? I mean, if you're uh, 
working on this in front of your computer. Your computer has mass. You have mass. You're attracted to the computer. The computer's attracted to you. It's just that the force is so small, you don't feel it. When you have things that have a lar large mass, like the Earth and you, then you actually feel it. You feel it. Uh, it's the same force on the Earth from you, but the Earth is so much bigger, it doesn't really care. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. Okay, so in this problem, uh, we're given mass 1, mass 2. Uh, I'm not sure I wrote that down correctly. I have to check that out. I think maybe it was 120, but I'll take a look at it in a minute. Just verify that this is the, the other mass. You probably have different numbers anyway. And then here's the distance between them. So just like we saw in the formula above, here's the picture that goes along with this formula right here. Um, we want to figure out the force of attraction between these. So here's our new formula, Newton's Universal Gravitational Force Law. So um, the force between them, big G, that's the 6.67 to the minus 11th number. You know the first mass, you know the second mass, just verify that I actually wrote that down right. And then divided by the distance between them, you'll get the force, and you'll see this is really small. Uh, part B is we want to compare the weight, and now the weight is the force of gravity between the earth and the, and the second ball. The weight of that ball to the, uh, to the attraction between the two balls. So the weight of the second ball would just be the mass of the ball times g. Again, verify how much that actually is. So take the answer from the first part, divide it by the weight, and you'll see it's a really, really small fraction. So you get a really small number. You might actually have to put your calculator into scientific mode to get a number there. All right, let's look at the last problem. Okay, the International Space Station is in a 240 meter, or sorry, 240 mile high orbit. That means it's 240 miles above the surface of the Earth. We want to know the station's uh, orbital speed, and they give us a few numbers here. That the radius of the Earth is given 6.37 times 10 to the sixth meters. We know the mass of the Earth is given also 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Okay, those are both SI units, which is excellent. So we want to know the speed of the space station and then also the period of the space station. Just be careful, I think that we want the period in minutes. So our answer will come out in SI units, which is seconds. You'll have to convert it into minutes. All right, let's take a look at this. Okay, so here's the space station at some height above the Earth. I think they told you 240 miles. You'll have to turn that into meters, though. So convert that into meters. Um, radius of the Earth is given 6.37 times 10 to the 6th. Uh, mass of the Earth is given. From this, we are supposed to calculate the speed and the period. So the space station is going in a circle. There has to be a force towards the center whenever anything goes in a circle. Here it's the force of gravity. Let's look at uh, Newton's second law for the space station. Net force mass of the station times A, special kind of A. They don't give us the mass of the space station, but probably it's going to cancel out. Let's take a look and see if it does. So um, M of the space station, V squared over R. Now remember, R is the distance from the center to where it's at. So you have to figure that out. Get the radius of the Earth in meters, uh, which is actually given in meters. Add the 240 miles, but make sure you turn that into meters. Okay, good. So we're trying to figure out V. Here's a formula with V in it. So what is the force towards the center? It's the uh, force of gravity, which is big G, mass of the space station, mass of the Earth. Remember, it's the first mass times the second mass. And here, the first mass is the mass of the Earth, and the other mass is the mass of the space station. And then divided by uh, distance between them squared. Okay, so this is just... Uh, this is really just MA. Here's the force that's towards the center. And we can clean this up a lot. If you notice, the mass of the space station is in both terms. It cancels out. There's an R here and an R squared here, so one of those cancels. So let me actually do this. This cancels with one of those. Mass of the space station cancels with mass of the space station. So we're left with uh, V squared is equal to big G mass of the Earth divided by R. So again, take the square root of that to get the speed. And just remember, this R is radius of the Earth plus the height.
so you can get the V that way. And then once you have V that way, um, you can get the period because V is 2 pi R divided by the period. So the period then would have to be 2 pi R divided by V. Okay, and then you'll have to, to convert this into minutes. You might be surprised by what a short amount of time it takes for the space station to go around the Earth. Not days, not months, more like, uh, you know, minutes. Okay, excellent. If you have any questions, just send me an email, gbricker at pnw, and then we can uh, arrange to communicate with each other. Okay, hopefully this was helpful. Talk to you soon.